you would like to hold the invitation pen, that'll be page 385. And our communion hymn today will be page 362. I am thine, O Lord. On the night Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, after he spoke of his impending betrayal, the atmosphere and the mood around the table became very heavy in sorrow. The disciples were confused. In a few hours, Jesus' suffering would begin, first in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus was betrayed and forsaken by the very disciples with whom he had dined with. He was made to stand before the priest and others who hurled false accusations and insults at him. Jesus chose to have the Passover with the disciples right before the events of that dark night unfolded. He wanted them to know what his sacrifice would mean for them when he laid down his life for theirs and his blood was shed for the forgiveness of the world. Now reading out of Luke uh, 22, verses 15 through 20. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take eat, or take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. The Lord's Supper was instituted at a time of darkness. So when we are going through good times and bad, through the light and the dark, we can partake in the communion and remember that Jesus' sacrifice was made for us, that we may have hope of eternal life one day. We remember him as the bread of life who gave his body so we can have everlasting life. And he's also the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we can be holy and blameless in God's eyes and with the Father forever. I'll ask the elders to pray.
given for continued part of storm work. So thank you for this day. Thank you for the wonderful blessings you've given to us. I pray, Heavenly Father, to be with us as we come around your table. Thank you, Father, for this cup to be filled with your son's dear blood. We just pray that you bring him up in heaven. Thank you so much for this church. We pray for their heart. And we start to have a mighty healing of David Wells by laying on his hands today. Forgive us now, Lord, your gentle. Help us, Father, to always do your will. Help us, Father, to the day, Lord. We thank you for all your blessings. This is our prayer in your son's name. Amen. <laughs> Each of us have been greatly blessed throughout this past week. Now it's time for us to be able to give back some of those blessings. I'll ask uh, Teddy Tipton if he'd pray for the offering.
Let's all stand together this morning and sing with a happy voice that I am blessed. It's good to see you this morning. I noticed Mickey's not here this morning, and he wasn't yet at our uh, uh, gathering yesterday. Has anybody heard from Mickey? Well, like I said, he wasn't there yesterday. He's not here today. I didn't know if anybody had heard from him. Uh, Kelly's not here. Uh, look back and see uh, Ellie's not with us, and uh, we got empty spots everywhere. Some of it's to do with this whole sinus stuff of going around and so we want to pray for those and those that are traveling because we miss them when they're not here. Uh, Melissa said something this morning when she got out of the car up here. You know, she's had a lot going on, some sickness and death in the family. And she said, I just don't understand how some people you can talk to. And they'll say, oh, well, I go to church. I haven't been in a few weeks or a month or so. She said, she don't understand how you operate in this life without the Lord. And I've got under, I, under, I agree with that. How do you operate without the church, without being faithful to the word? And uh, if, you, if you're sick and you can't make it, if you've got that occasional trip out of town and you can't make it, that's one thing, but uh, um, that's understandable. But if you don't have a, if, if there's not a something greatly lacking in your life when you miss the church service, you got a problem. You got a problem. Uh, but let's look around and see those that aren't here, check on them. Uh, to make sure that they are uh, okay, or if there's anything we can do, uh, that they, you know, if they're not in the Lord's house today, just to make sure that they're okay. Check on them, check on them, and see to their needs. We're supposed to as Christians. We were uh, had just gone to bed the other night. This has been weeks, maybe even months ago, and I thought as this progressed, this story, I thought well, that that could make a decent sermon, you know. Uh, uh, Probably something I've talked on many times before. But anyway, this woman and her husband and family, they lived in Las Vegas. And the area of, yes. Is that better? Okay. They lived in Las Vegas. It's an area of Las Vegas where the most influential people lived. If you had money, you lived there. If you lived there, there's no way you didn't have a lot of money. That's what the area was known for. You know, I just had to say, it's a good-looking feller. He's quite, you know, he was built well, carried himself well, worth millions of dollars, had a wonderful company, had a wife that he bragged on and showed off every time that he could. If he went on a business trip, he took her with him. If he went across the road, he took her with him. You know, he was proud of her, loved her. She wasn't no great beauty queen. She wasn't knocked down gorgeous. She was okay. But he really thought she was something. Had a beautiful little girl and little boy. You know, early elementary age. Just a wonderful looking family. Seemed to be happy. And, uh, of course, we know that that can't be the case if it's on one of these shows on TV. Something's happened. And I said, well, she's looking at a piece of mail or something, opening mail, and I've got a text and the guy's working or whatever, but this caught my attention, you know. Uh, when you see a perfect, seeming in a happy, happy family, good-looking people, a good-looking, great situation. One of the friends, though, when they uh, 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 interviewed her said, well, what people don't know is there was a lot of fighting that went on. A lot of fighting for years in the family because she really wasn't attracted to him anymore. And she really resisted him and didn't have time. She was tired. She's wore out. She's got two kids. She's got a house. She didn't have no time for him. But yet at the end of the story, you find out there was many other fellas she had plenty of time for. You know. And then another friend popped up, and this is what caught my attention. The friend said, when asked about it, said her real problem was that she wanted to be able to point at something and say, I did that. 
Everywhere she went, she was known as John's wife, and she just wasn't all about that anymore. She wanted to achieve something. She had an education. She's this and that. And that. She wanted to point out something and say, I did that. And I thought, man, she's got a husband that loves her to death that do anything for her that keeps her taken care of, that wants to be with her. How many women, do you, and maybe some of you here, had a husband that didn't want nothing to do with you? I've met a lot of women that had husbands that wanted nothing to do with them. This man was different. He really loved her, really thought she was something, was really attracted to her, wanted everybody else to see her, and he took care of her. But why couldn't she look at that marriage and say, man, you see that happy man over there? You see this good marriage you've got? I done that. Why wasn't that important to her? Why can't she look at the little boy and girl, precious little children, and be ready at a point when they grew up and they were decent uh, humans, they were uh, additions to society, uh, you know, they were smart and they worked hard and they had ambition. Why wasn't it important for her to look at that later in life and be able to say, hey, you see those two right there? You see how they act and conduct themselves? I did that. Why wasn't that important to her? But she was not happy, her friend said, because she couldn't look at something and say, I did that. I achieved that. So because of that, she wasn't happy. And of course, she divorced him, tore the family all to pieces. And it, wouldn't, it wasn't amazing that it wasn't, but hours later, she had a bodybuilder man living with her. That, that don't just happen in a few hours. That takes time, which means it's going on before. But anyway, now she had what she needed. He set her up in the business. She could point at that and say, that's my company. I did that. And that happened just within weeks. Business, opportunities, and then him bodybuilder and strength conditioner and trainer and all of this until they come and knocked on the door one day when she was diced up like an onion. Great how long that happiness lasted before he didn't treat her like she wanted to be treated and had been treated and he decided he wasn't being embarrassed for having none of that so she no longer walks the face of the earth. Right how happy she is now. Right how happy she is. She got a man she could really have something to do with. She had a man better than what she had. And had a business. Had something that made her important. How happy do you reckon she was as he diced her like a cucumber? Hmm? Happiness. Contentment. The world's looking for it everywhere. What does it actually mean to be happy? What does it mean? Think about that. The majority of the way the world explains happiness, I look, you know, I look around, I look at the homosexual world today, and they're all giddy, giddy, and happy, and they talk like this and go on, and they're just prancing around, happy as they can be. You reckon they're really happy? They live a life they know is godless and against nature. They know that. They know that every day they wake up, every day they go to bed, they're living continually in sin. They know that. But they're supposed to be the example of happiness in the United States of America today. But yet they're filled with uh, suicide. That community is filled uh, with disease, sickening diseases, hate, infighting, passing around like a $2 Corner woman. But it seems that happiness is a very important subject. And everybody seems to be going to it. But does God want you happy? Now, you know, you watch the TV shows, you see the things going on in your neighbor's houses or your neighbor's lives that aren't Christians. Well, God really can't do nothing about their happiness. But what about you as a Christian? Me as a Christian, does God want us happy? Now, I want you to think about that question for a second. And don't jump so quick to answer. You know, sometimes you see these TV uh, shows and they're interviewing people and sometimes they'll do it to, oh, they won't do it to this president, they did it to the last one where they said, no, no, this is a yes or no answer. Do you this or do you that? 
and they're trying to back him in the corner. Some questions you can't answer with a simple yes or no. Does God want you happy? That's not a simple yes or no answer to that. God, I think by the scripture, wants us happy in the way he designed to make us happy. If you've chosen a man or a woman as your husband or wife, uh, then you are to live in that marriage in love with each other, uh, everything about a husband and wife until the day you die. Is that not what it says? You're not supposed to be ready to uh, deal them when a better offer comes along. You're not to get tired of them. Uh, you're not to decide that uh, you need a break from them. That's the thing today. Everybody needs their time. Have you ever heard that? I need my time. I was asking Cindy the other day, when do we ever have our time? I have yet to ever come home and think, whew, it's been a hard year. Listen, I'm going to go to uh, Bermuda for a week. i got to get away from you and everybody else. And when I get back, you can go. That has yet to happen. And listen, it will not happen. If she wants away from me, she can go for good. And if I want away from her, I promise you that's the same attitude. I ain't coming back in the door. But that's the attitude of people today. That's the way they get their happiness, going and doing what they want to do for themselves. That was the woman's problem in this, in this show that we had watched a few weeks ago. Does God want us happy? Yes, in the way he defines happiness. Happiness, not in the way you define happiness, but in the way he does. Only pursuing happiness the way he says to pursue it, the only ways he permits us to pursue it, pursue it not if the pursuit of happiness ends up in us sinning. Do you want me to say that again? Does God want you happy? Yes, according to the ways he wants you to be happy. And not if being happy means you have to sin. Then no, God's not for your happiness. Not if it only comes forth in a world of evil and of sin. Which in the end, does it bring happiness anyway? That kind of happiness is temporary. Usually minutes. Maybe an hour or so. But usually minutes. Is how temporary worldly happiness is. You know, there's also a brand of Christianity out there. It's called the prosperity doctor. It's supposed to doctrine, prosperity doctor. It's supposed to make everybody happy because it makes everybody wealthy, makes everybody rich, gives them everything in life to enjoy, to enjoy and to prosper in every way because God wants you happy. Ain't that what they say? Have you heard the TV preachers? Why, the bookstores over here are filled with the books of the prosperity doctrine. God wants you happy. God wants you to have all kinds of money and all kinds of wealth. And God wants you to take exotic vacations. And God wants you to do this. And God wants you to do that. See, that's a brand of false doctrine pushing happiness. Because they realized if we can convince people of what they need to do to be happy, and just to make them happy, or well, it's going to cost them, to us, for us to preach it and teach it. If we can convince them, the money will not stop rolling in, and that's the truth. Preachers, worth, they're billionaires with their planes and their multi-million dollar houses, and uh, goodness, the prosperity doctor seems to be good for everybody, but the one that's bought into it. And that's because this is a ploy of Satan himself. This is a doctrine of Satan himself that says whatever you want, you can go and do it. God wants you happy. But real happiness, people, and this is what I want us to see from today. Real happiness only exists if your relationship with the Lord is right. That's the only way you can have real happiness. True happiness. It doesn't come from experiencing good days every day. It doesn't come from everything being easy and no problems, no hardships, no mountains to climb. Real happiness doesn't come from getting everything I want. So that means the prosperity doctrine in itself is a lie because you're not going to get everything you want, because not everything you want is good for you. 
If you're a Christian, the Lord will help to determine what's best and what isn't. But when Christianity is presented in such a fashion that everything's wonderful, everything's good, all you've done is set up people for a disaster, for heartache, for disappointment. Uh, we've reduced God to nothing more than some uh, outer space candy machine. That's what the religious world thinks of him. They go and they say their little prayer. That's putting their couple of quarters in. Then they push their button of what they want from God. And it better fall out of the slot. And if it doesn't fall out of the slot, then whose fault is it? That's God's fault. He doesn't really want me to be happier. He'd have made sure that what I selected, I have received. You see, that's the attitude of the world today. Another way of misunderstanding that God, whether or not God wants me happy or if God wants me happy or not, is when we are doing wrong, obviously, and we say, well, it's okay, that makes me happy, and God wants me happy. You see, so when you ask the question, does God want me happy, it's not a simple yes or no. You can't say, well, yes, God wants me happy with this sinful activity. I leave my wife and go over to my girlfriend for the afternoon to stay with her, and that's okay, nothing wrong with it. It makes me happy. God wants me happy. Having relations with one that's not your husband or your wife, but it makes me feel good. Overcharging and doing people wrong and stealing from them, well, it makes me happy. It increases my life, and God wants me happy, so I'll continue to go on. And that's one of the big justifications for same-sex relationships, same-sex marriage, and all the special rights that they're after, so on and so forth. That's a big justification for them is they love each other. And they seem so happy. And God wants everybody to be happy. Is the life of a homosexual lesbian, is that a sin? Is it against God? Is going out and having a relationship with one that's not your husband or your wife, is that a sin? Is that against God? Is stealing, is that a sin? Is that against God? If it's against God and it makes you happy, uh, the, the Lord ain't your daddy, the devil is. That's who you please. That's who you please. God does not, does not want you happy living in a sinful life. God doesn't want you to take pleasure from doing that which is wrong. Does God want me happy? Yes. Does God allow me to determine what makes me happy? No. He doesn't allow me to determine what makes me happy. You see, there are a lot of things we think will make us happy, but in the end, don't. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced that. I thought that would make me happy, but it didn't. Well, me and you there, me and you, about, there's about five of us. Everybody else in this room, everything that you ever thought would make you happy, it did, didn't it? You're a liar. I'll be simply honest with you. You're a flat-out liar. Everybody in here has made choices thinking what this is going to do is best for them, going to make them happy, and it slapped you in the face, kicked you like a thoroughbred horse and knocked you right off your perfect little saddle. Every one of us has thought, I'm going to do that. That'll make me happy, and it made you miserable. That's because you didn't do it the Lord's way. Uh, we think things will make us happy. We're going to think pleasure-seeking revenge will make us happy. It's only temporary. New things get old quick. And they lose their luster. Pleasure is only for the minute that it's happening there. God's definition of happiness is so much different than ours. This is a long introduction into the sermon, isn't it? Didn't said too much. Well, I'm sorry, didn't. Would you like to preach it for me? Do I have to have, look, tell me the verse in Scripture where it comes up and says you've got to give a verse of Scripture for your, no, I'm not going to get into it. You don't like it, I'm sorry. Pay attention to what I'm saying anyway because it'll come from the Bible. You all understand that. I don't care if you like what I got to say. 
I ain't just come up with a sermon yet that I've cared what anybody in here liked about it, all right? If it's proven by the Word of God, that's all I care. Not whether you're living, uh, shacking up and having sex with a person that's not your husband or your wife for years or for decades or whatever, and you think you're okay, and I say something again that offends you, that's your problem. That ain't my problem. If you're uh, out here partying and going on acting like you shouldn't and you're claiming to be happy and making everybody around you miserable and you don't like what I got to say, that's your problem, ain't my problem. I go out this door a lot easier than I came in it. Understand? We got a good explanation of that? Good. Good. If you want to give me an outline of sermons and how they're supposed to go, you can leave it out there in the box. I'll look at it later, all right? Yeah, that round can. Happiness of God is not grounded in physical and material things. Stuff your mattress with all the wealth you can. All right? And it'll never bring you happiness as a Christian. And a lot of Christians do that. They like to hide their wealth. They like to store it up. Instead of taking care of those that are Christians, to take and see to the needs of others. Only the God who made us knows us, and can bring us happiness. Go to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. Psalm 68, verse 3. But let the righteous, who? Well, who is that? Well, you can only be righteous if you're living faithful to the word of God, can you not? Let the righteous be what? Does that sound like to me God don't care if the rest of the world's happy or not? Sound like that to you? Let the righteous be glad. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Singing unto the Lord and singing praises to his name. Let the righteous be glad and let them exceedingly rejoice. You say, oh, I would if I wasn't so depressed and down. Oh, I would if I wasn't so unhappy. Well, whose fault is that? Is that the Lord's fault? Because the righteous are supposed to be glad. The righteous are exceedingly joyous. Did you catch that? So if you're not and you can't be, what's that tell you about yourself? Hmm? Righteousness comes from being obedient to the word of God. The happiness in which we see in, in the world today and in which too many people try to go after is completely dependent on chance and their situation in life. The joy that God offers us is in, totally independent of chances or circumstances of life. Worldly happiness, it all depends on that. What are the chances? What's your circumstances surrounding you? That's the reason some people are real happy today. And tomorrow, they're the most depressed individuals you ever saw. On top of the world today, down there. Because chance, by chance, the circumstances did this and took away my happiness. In the Lord, true happiness in the Lord does not matter on what's going on around you. What has happened or what has not happened. The happiness that God gives is blessedness. There's a difference. That's greater than happiness. When we realize the blessings that come from God, what all He has done for us in that life, in that situation, that's where our happiness comes from, not based on circumstances. Not. True happiness is knowing the word of God and following God's plan. And there's no better example of that than the Apostle Paul. And when he wrote the Philippian letter, he wrote it while he was in prison, while he was facing sentence. So go with me to Philippians, the fourth chapter. 
And we're going to find out about happiness as God defines it. Happiness is when you're done flipping. I want you to make sure you hear this. Happiness is based on you doing what God wants you to do in your life. Happiness, true happiness is based on you doing what God wants you to do in your life. Paul understood this. This is why Paul, in no matter his situation, no matter his circumstances, he was happy. And he demanded and commanded that his readers be happy. Writing this letter from prison, Philippians the fourth chapter, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Now he's in prison, right? Awaiting sentence, right? And yet he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. But now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of won't, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. He was happy. He was full of joy, but yet in prison with probably no food, no water, Rats, roaches, every other disgusting thing around him, yet he's happy, yet he's full of joy. And how can that be? He gave us a word there, and the word's content. He was content doing the work of the Lord, doing what the Lord had set out for him in his life to do, and that was to go take the gospel to the Gentiles. In this he was pleased. This brought him joy. This brought him strength. This brought him happiness. This brought him peace. No matter where he was, he was living for the Lord, doing what the Lord wanted him to do. Go back to Philippians, the first chapter. Let's look at a couple of verses there real quick to kind of back up what this was. Philippians, the first chapter, verse 12. But I would have, but I would, uh, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Bad things happened in Paul's life, painful things. He endured it, he was good with it because it brought out furtherance and spread more of the gospel of Christ so that my bonds in Christ are manifest, they're, n- they're known. What I'm here for is known all over the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, because of me, because of me doing what the Lord wants me to do, living like the Lord wants me to live, many brethren in the Lord are waxing confident because of my bonds, and they are more bold to speak the word without fear. Our joy and happiness has to be grounded in our relationship with the Lord. You say, well, I don't know, I don't preach, or I don't teach, or I can't go out on missionary trips, or I this, or I that, or the other. 
I think everybody's got a talent in the Lord. He may have read that. Go to Romans, the 12th chapter. Go to Romans chapter 12 real quick. I can finish some of this up tonight. Romans, the 12th chapter. Uh, let me see here. Look at verse 6, Romans 12, 6. We all have then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. That is what it is the Lord wants you to do with your life. He's given you the talent there to do it. Whether prophecy, then prophesy according to the propitiation of faith. Ministry, wait upon your ministry. He that teacheth, do your teaching. He that exhorteth on exhortation. What's exhorting? Do you mean to tell me that it is a talent and a work of God maybe in your life to be a, somebody that lifts people up, to exhort others? You think that's a talent and a mission in somebody's life? I think it is a mission and a talent in many people's lives in the church. And they are to lift up, they are to encourage that's a gift from God. Don't say, I don't have no gifts. I don't know what I'm going to do. Encourage somebody. A lot of us are good at stomping them under our feet and trying to grind them in the ground or they scream. We're good at that, ain't we? Try to encourage somebody. According to this, this is a gift from God's grace. Do you catch that? Don't act like you can't do nothing. The least you can do is try to see if you got the gift of encouragement. That's phenomenal to me. He that giveth, let him do with simplicity. Can you give? Can you give with the desire to help the church and to help others or give of time and money and talent? He that ruleth with diligence. Here's another gift, somebody that shows mercy. Think of that. And you won't act like you don't have a gift from God because you can't preach or you can't do some phenomenal thing for the whole world to see. That's like that woman that we started out with. Wasn't happy and people aren't in there happy in their relationship with God because they can't point and say, I did that. Isn't that a shame? When every one of us has got a talent from the lowliest of things, of giving, lifting up and encouraging, showing mercy. These are gifts that the Lord said you need to use. Quit giving the excuse, well, I can't do this, and I ain't got time for that, and oh, law this, and law that, and oh, well, if I could, but how, how wash. You ain't happy because you ain't wanting to live for the Lord and use what the Lord give you as a service to Him. You're wanting something bigger and better just like that woman. And in the end, you end up just like her, all diced up. That's a second death called hell. And if you want to read 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, he pretty much talks the same kind of things about differing gifts. In different ways in which we all have and things that we can do. If you will do those things in service to the Lord that His name be lifted up, you'll be happy. No matter what's going on in your life. Because that's what Paul was doing. He was full of joy. He was happy to write. His joy, his happiness was grounded in doing what the Lord wanted him to do which was take the gospel to the Gentiles and to preach it wherever he wants. Listen, we can trust that when we're living our lives for the Lord, doing what we can, our gifts for the Lord, uh, we can trust that in every situation we'll never enter one that isn't known by God. God knows every situation we're in. He knew where the Apostle Paul was here. He knew what was going on. And he knew by that that the gospel would explode. That people would say, well, if you're going to put my friend Paul in jail and he's done nothing wrong, I'm going to take that gospel. I'll preach it more forcefully than he did. I'll go where he has not gone. That's the attitude that the early church took up. They weren't going to be silenced. And Paul says, because I'm doing what the Lord wanted me to do, the church is growing. The Christians are becoming stronger and stronger and stronger as long as we do everything that is right by the word of God. 
to bring him praise and glory and honor. That's why the New Testament tells us that we should rejoice in suffering. Rejoice in suffering. If you're living a life as a Christian and that's why you suffer, rejoice in it. If you're suffering over evil deeds and doing evil and wrong, then you deserve to suffer. But if you're working for the Lord, if you're doing one of those things, showing mercy, encouraging, giving, teaching, preaching, inspiring, whatever your gift is, if you're doing it and you're suffering in this life, great for you, says James. It's great. It builds character. It builds patience. It builds maturity in the Lord. People aren't happy because people don't want to live according to God's word. That's why they're not happy. Christian homes are happy homes where the people in there are wanting to live by the word of God. Churches are happy churches where everybody there is concerned about living by the word of God. Churches are full churches where the people are really worried about living by the word of God. You're here today and I said look around there's quite a few don't look too happy. He ain't sounded happy and it may have been for some time. Well, that's nobody's fault but yours. I'm sorry. Because we are told if we will live by the word of God, live in our lives as he has directed us to, that we'll be full of joy. And we're going to see down times, and we're going to see hard times, and we're going to see suffering. doesn't mean that we can't be happy, especially with those that are other Christians. Especially in the world where they're looking and they know we're Christian. They say, Mom, look at the way that poor person's acting. Look at what they posted on Facebook. That's a Christian. Look how she's talked about her husband or he's talked about his wife or how much they hate their job or how awful this. Or You know, if the world don't see you as happy and you're a Christian, why do they want to be a Christian? You're living just like they did but with restrictions. No, no, we'll live like the world. That's the way the Christian seems to be. The Christian needs to see that, yeah, we suffer things. The world needs to see that we suffer things, but we endure through it with thankfulness and happiness because we're commanded to, because our hope's not in this place. It's an eternal home that those who have repented and been baptized to meet the blood of Jesus that washed their sins away, that's the home they go to if as Teddy said in his lesson this morning, if they continue to remain faithful. Our hope's not here. Our happiness isn't based on this place. Boys, if it is in your life, that's short-lived. Our happiness is based on the fact that one day we get to get out of here and we get to go home to be with the Lord forever. But that ain't even an option if you're not a Christian. So if you're not saved this morning, don't put it off any longer. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, and we want you to come. We want you to think about the story I told today, and you can have everything in this world. Beautiful family, beautiful husband or wife, wonderful job, wonderful vehicles. Is true happiness really there? No, it wasn't there. Sin came in, divorce came in, split came in, murder entered in. That's what you get when you rely on the happiness of this world. It has to be in a righteous life for the Lord. And if you're not living that, today's the day to change. We'll stand and sing verse 1.